Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon to our witnesses. I appreciate you both being here. Uh, the National Commission on the Future of the Army had an ambitious task, and I commend the commissioners, the two of you, uh, and their staff for the work they put into this report. I'd also like to thank the chairman for opening the hearing to the full committee, as these topics impact the men and women of our Army stationed across the country and around the world. As many of us in this hearing have heard before, the Army is being asked to do more with less against an array of diverse and complex global threats. These constraints require the Army, the Department of Defense, and Congress to closely examine the appropriate distribution of active guard and reserve forces, as well as the right mix of capabilities needed to defend the United States and its allies. Today's challenges also require the Army to ensure that it is optimizing the performance of its soldiers to see that they remain the best trained and best equipped force in the world. The Commission's recommendations appear to fall into three broad categories. First, the Commission made specific recommendations regarding the size, location, and composition of the Army. Second, the Commission report makes many recommendations on how to further integrate the reserve components of the Army, the National Guard, and Army Reserve with the regular Army. Finally, the report includes recommendations on the future of Army aviation, and in particular, the question of where Apache helicopters should reside. I look forward to hearing more details about how the Commission reached its conclusions on all these topics. I would also like to hear more about the cost associated with the Commission's recommendations. If Congress chooses to pursue any of the recommendations in the report, the money will have to come from somewhere, either within the Army or from another military services budget. Fully understanding these potential trade-offs is a critical part of considering the Commission's recommendations. These are not easy decisions to make and I appreciate the opportunity to have a robust debate here in Congress on the way forward. I look forward to hearing more about how you arrived at some of your key recommendations. Thank you, and with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I want to follow up. Um, uh, you've, you've given issued 63 total recommendations, uh, and close to 20 of those were directed towards Congress that we needed to act. But I'm curious how you would rank order them, if there are some that you see um, more pressing and others that could be addressed later. And we'll, I'll start with you, General Hamm. Uh, thanks, ma'am. Uh, we, we purposely did not prioritize the recommendations, but, but I think it, I'll, I'll offer my thoughts on, on um, ones that, that perhaps might require a little more attention than others. For, for me, it would begin with the very first recommendation that says maintain and sustain the all-volunteer force. And clearly, Congress's role in that is absolutely essential. I think, frankly, if we don't do that, the rest of it almost doesn't matter, because uh, we've got to have the, the quality women and men to, to join the Army that, that are necessary. Uh, secondly, I, I would emphasize the, the Congress's role in, um, in assuring predictable and responsible budgeting uh, for the Army. I think, uh, I think that is absolutely vital to give uh, that element of, of stability and predictability to the Army uh, in, its, in its funding uh, processes. Uh, thirdly, there are a number of recommendations that, that address um, uh, specific actions uh, that, that cause the, the total force policy to be implemented more fully. Some of those require some legislative change, and so I would group those total force recommendations perhaps as a uh, as, a, as a next uh, priority for the Congress to, to address. Uh, and, then, and then, again, uh, just the, the, the larger um, uh, recommendation with regard to the, the size and readiness of the force, the 980,000 at required levels of readiness, uh, I think uh, that would ob obviously also rank very, very high. Secretary Hale, would you agree with that, or would you have a slightly different no, I, I agree with that. I want to underscore that need for predictable budgets. This turmoil is just eating the time of senior leaders and the Congress, I might add. Let me just give a couple of examples of the last theme that General Ham raised, and, and that is integrating uh, into the total force. I think the Apache recommendation actually fits within this category. Uh, and it, if, we, if you follow the Commission's recommendation, there will be one other area of connective tissue uh, between the Guard and the regular Army. 
But the recommendations on multi-component units are also, I think, very important. Uh, the Army's already doing this, uh, but I think uh, the Commission believes they could do more. And we made some specific suggestions for a pilot program in aviation uh, that would, uh, could lead to more multi-component units. And there are a number of others, like integrated recruiting. So there, there are several, I think, specific ideas that fit within the theme that General Ham raised of uh, integrating the, uh, the regular Army and the Guard in a, in a better manner. Did you identify costs associated with that integration? And how did you, or, or not? And if so, how would you pay for them? Were there trade-offs you would make in favor of that moving forward in that way? Ma'am, the, the, uh, the one area where we tried to uh, address costs specifically as a trade-offs was in the aviation uh, realm. Uh, for the other recommendations, we, we did not, frankly, time and capacity of, of the staff and, and expertise um, we, we did not offer, we did not have the time to offer specific uh, cost findings with many of the other recommendations. I, I'm seated next to the cost expert, as you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> a title I'm trying to shed. <laughs> but Mr. Uh, Secretary, you might have some off the top of your head idea of cost. No, I think I won't go there. Uh, but I will say in the aviation area, we did uh, do costing there that Congress specifically tasked us to look at the Apache transfer. <clears throat> and uh, the, uh, although the Commission's recommendation adds to capacity and to peacetime capabilities, it does add to costs, uh, about $165 million a year in operating costs and around $400 million in one-time procurement costs. And we did offer an, what we called an illustration of ways to offset that cost uh, through a, a slight decrease in the size of the Black Hawk fleet and a, and a, a modest slowdown in the modernization of the fleet. It's not that Black Hawks aren't important, they are, uh, but uh, they're a large fleet and, and we felt that it was more important if, if there had to be, it had to offset the cost, it was more important to uh, accomplish the Apache transfer, even if some offsets had to be made. <clears throat> and there were some other general offsets uh, that were discussed as well. So uh, we, we certainly paid attention to costs, so as General Ham said, outside of aviation, we did not specifically cost each option. At least it's an acknowledgement that there are costs associated with this, and that in the world of constrained uh, resources, that as we move forward, we're going to have to think about that as we implement or not some of these recommendations. But, but some of them won't add to costs. I mean, for example, the multi-component units, if you use the same units, I mean, unless you add the units, you won't significantly add to costs. I think some of the things can be done without significantly added costs, and, and I would hope uh, that when you see the Army's response that they will identify some of those for you. Uh, I have a follow-on question. In the end, it, it, it comes down, in an all-volunteer force and in any, in any army, it comes down to the people that, that you're able to attract. And um, what I'd like to do, one of the recommendations was you, don't, you want to stop cuts in the overall size of the army. Um, but even if this was followed, our troop levels will st still be at the lowest levels in decades. So that's why I do think that those you do have um, are of the highest caliber. So how can the Army continue to improve the physical, the psychological, the cognitive, the overall human performance of the force to make sure that those that you're attracting uh, are able to perform at the highest level and you make the most of every soldier? Well, thanks, ma'am. As you know, that was not a specific charge uh, to the Commission to, to look at that issue. So if you'll allow me to uh, step away from my role as, as chairman and, and, and speak perhaps as some of the things that we observed uh, throughout the force. The, the young women and men uh, of the Army, all three components, regular Army, Army National Guard, uh, Army Reserve, uh, what we heard loud and clear is that they joined to serve. They want to be utilized. So that's part of, uh, I think, the recruiting and retention challenge for a quality force is use that force. We, we heard, this is anecdotal, but we heard from a number of, of young soldiers, mid-grade soldiers, uh, particularly in the reserve components, that if they weren't going to be utilized, if they weren't going to be operationally employed, well, they might choose to do something else. So I think that has an important uh, part of it. M more, uh, I think a second component to successful recruiting and retention is that the, the, the young people who we had the great fortune to, to engage with across the Army, uh, they, they want to feel like uh, what they're doing makes a difference, that they're making a valuable contribution. 
Certainly, they're concerned about compensation. That's an, that, is a, that is certainly a, an important piece of this. But it's not only the piece. It, it's not the only piece uh, of their sense uh, of service. And so I think it's this, this combination of challenge, of importance of mission, uh, combined with, uh, with, with a, the proper level of compensation that will allow the Army to continue to attract in an admittedly uh, declining pool of eligible uh, women and men across the country to serve, but will continue to attract the, 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 the bright young people that the nation needs in its Army to maintain its vitality and effectiveness. Secretary Hale, do you have any thoughts about it? Yeah. It's, it's not an easy challenge uh, that, you, that the Army then has taken on in terms of just making sure it can recruit and retain uh, those that can meet, meet the test, whatever they may be, uh, and to assure that you have the capabilities you need across the force as well, not just that the individual is feeling well, well, well able to contribute to the highest level, but that you're also finding all the talent you need for the specific jobs, and you kind of align them properly. Yes, ma'am. I think I think that's right. And of course, the the requirements are are changing. Uh, but I think we find we found certainly young people with highly technical um, um, educational backgrounds that are attracted to work in in growing fields such as cyber defense a, and the like. And so, looking for opportunities to match those skills and attributes that that young people bring with the needs of the Army, uh, I think, will be a vital component to, to, again to maintaining the the excellence that the, that the Army uh, has achieved over many years. And I, I would add just one other point is they also, the people, also, people who serve, they want to know uh, that they are serving in the, in the world's best Army. That's, uh, that, that requires a continued emphasis on leader development. It also entails uh, a commitment to modernizing the force to make sure that, that the soldiers are properly equipped uh, to encounter any potential adversary. Thank, Thank you, you Mr. Chairman. I, I wanted to follow up on an earlier question um, and focus it, focus it a little differently. You know, as we are talking about end strength and uh, what the proper number is, I think what we're all concerned with is the, the resiliency of the force and the pressures that come to bear, given the multiple challenges. And I've seen in Massachusetts where there's been a lot of research investment in sort of making just better understanding, uh, as I said, how you improve the physical, the psychological, the cognitive, the overall human performance of the force with the interest of in understanding the, uh, the, un the inordinate number of, of pressures that come to bear on those who do serve. And my question really is, do you see value in that going forward as we're still, no matter what, but in a constrained environment we're asked, where we ask ever more of those who are serving, do you see value in that kind of research and development effort? Yes, ma'am, ab absolutely. Um, in, in, two, in two ways. One is, is simply from a readiness standpoint. Uh, we want to make sure that, the, that soldiers are as ready as they can be, and as you, as you indicate, that's, that's more than just technical or tactical training uh, or, uh, uh, or, or other means of readiness, but it, it is readiness of the whole person uh, that, is, that is vitally important. So that, I think from a, a purely readiness standpoint, that's quite important. In, a, in perhaps a, a less uh, objective measure, it is also, uh, I think, integral to re recruiting and retaining the quality people that we need uh, to know that when they when they raise their right hand and and enlist in or in the army or are commissioned as an officer in the army that they are joining a profession that will attend to their needs and make sure that they are properly cared for and they are as capable and as ready to uh, to perform at maximum levels as is possible and it also sends a very clear message to their families that we will care for your soldier uh, when. when when the, the, the worst possible things that can happen to soldiers happen, that their families have confidence that the Army will take care of them in those dire circumstances. So for those reasons, I think the points you mentioned are absolutely essential. Thank you. Uh, Secretary Hale, do you? No. Uh, the other question is we've been debating end strength here, and, um, and I think we're all, we're all concerned about what the appropriate number is. 
But if you look at the current situation, we have soldiers of the U.S. Army deployed in over 140 countries around the world. Some are obviously uh, fighting, engaged in the fight. Some are there in a deterrence mode. Other are there just to reassure allies uh, and partners. And as we struggle with fiscal constraints, did you at all consider whether or not the Army is spread too thin? And is there better, should we be better channeling those that we do have in order to, for example, reduce the pressure on the deployed soldier and give them more dwell time? Was that part of your consideration? It, it was, ma'am. In fact, the law required us to, to look at that. Um, I think in a general sense, the Commission's view was uh, one of the very best ways to alleviate uh, the, the, the frequent operational deployments, particularly within the regular Army, is to ensure that the reserve components of the Army are adequately trained, modernized, and prepared so that they can become more operationally uh, employed. It has, the, it has the value of relieving a little bit of operational stress on the regular force, but it also builds operational capability within the reserve components and, and ma'am, we heard loud and clear from those soldiers in the Army Reserve and Army National Guard that they have a burning desire to be operationally employed. So you didn't see it as uh, sort of retooling what the Army should be doing and where, but rather how you do it and who you have do it? Well, it's, a, it's a, certainly a mix of both. I think the, the demands from the combatant commands, um, uh, for the most part, are, are increasing. There are systems within the Army and within the the Joint Staff and the Office of the Secretary of Defense to prioritize and balance those demands. The demands will probably almost always exceed the, the supply, so it is a matter of, of prioritization. And I think in general the Commission's view was that if the Army can, uh, can more effectively employ uh, the operational forces in the Army National Guard and Army Reserve, that will go a long way toward meeting that demand and relieving some of the stress that is, re that is evident in some communities in the, in the regular Army. So and you I, really didn't like consider. I'd like to add to that if I okay. might. I, I fully agree. We need to use the Guard and the Reserve. We tried in the Commission to put our money where our mouth was on this one. For example, uh, when we suggested keeping four battalions or recommended keeping four battalions in the Guard, we included in the cost, uh, the added cost to call them up. Uh, on the one to five basis that is, uh, that is one of the planning uh, scenarios. And similarly, you've heard us say before, we recommended more funding for this 12304B, which provides funds to call up the Guard we repeat, and the Reserve. We repeatedly heard that the reason they're not used more is not that they don't want to go, it's that there isn't the funds to pay for them when they're called to active duty. So we tried uh, to, as I say, put our money where our mouth is. We need to use the Guard and the Reserve, and we need to fund it. Thank you. I yield back. 